Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this uh, evening. And uh, yeah, and uh, we're really happy to have you. Uh, today we have Professor Geraldine Go, uh, and uh, she's going to talk to us uh, about uh, Singapore and its role in uh, the space, role in uh, our, sp the, wait, okay, sorry. You know what the topic is about, that's why you signed up. So yeah, she's gonna talk to us about Singapore and its role in space through the perspective of policy and law. Yeah, and uh, before we get started, maybe I'll just go through some of the uh, slight housekeeping tips uh, just to make this a more conducive uh, session for everybody. Uh, firstly, um, there will be a Q&A session afterwards, so uh, you can hold your questions till then. Um, we would prefer if you actually try uh, uh, use your mic to ask the questions, uh, as then we will definitely notice you're talking and be able to answer it. Um, other than that, if you do respond in the chat, uh, do, uh, do feel free to do so and we'll, get, uh, we'll try to get to it. Uh, do introduce yourself if possible very briefly just so we know who we're addressing during the questions and uh, and yes about uh, and please uh, unless you are speaking uh, intentionally please uh, mute your mic so that it doesn't disrupt uh, what the other speakers are saying yeah with that uh, maybe I'll start very briefly while a few more people stream in I'll start very briefly with a bit about uh, us said Singapore and uh, then I'll hand it over to Professor Go uh, to take over the rest of this, uh, rest of the session. Yeah. So, so SET Singapore is Students for the Exploration and Development of Space uh, Singapore. We are a local chapter of uh, a global community and a global nonprofit organization. Um, we are students who run a, a nonprofit organization, basically that empowers uh, young people, students particularly to participate and make an impact in space exploration. Uh, to provide, uh, our vision is to provide a platform for students of all backgrounds based in Singapore to actively participate in ushering in a new space age. As of now, we have uh, more than 150 active members from diverse backgrounds, uh, not just engineering or STEM. We also have several uh, members from uh, the arts, uh, business, law, etc. So, uh, there are many chapters around the world and uh, so Singapore is, uh, there's more than 24 and Singapore is one of them. And uh, inside Singapore itself, there are two sub-chapters, SEDS and US, and US SEDS and SEDS NTU. Um, both of these chapters have their own projects that uh, they carry out and participate in competitions for. But uh, on a national level, uh, SEDS Singapore actually carries out two uh, of its own projects, such as uh, one is the SEDS Propulsion Lab, and the other is space policy unit. So the space policy unit is um, we, is the unit that is the are the people who have organized this event. And uh, we take we are um, all about bringing in the diverse range of views uh, from fairly different backgrounds to have an effective and um, uh, effective conversation about space and engage as many people in, into this conversation as we can. Yeah. Um, you might know about our insights report, which we have just very recently released. Uh, and it's a, it's a comprehensive report about the state of Singapore's space ecosystem with insights from the stakeholders themselves. Um, readers in, who read this can learn about the various perceptions, challenges, and opportunities that surround the industry. Uh, we urge you to download it at our websites, uh, sets-sg.space. SEDS um, if you have any questions or want to uh, take take it further or address any of the issues inside the report, please feel free to approach us. Uh, you can reach us at uh, any of the links mentioned here, or you can reach me directly uh, at the email mentioned below, arca at u.nus.edu. Yeah. So with that, uh, I, will, I will now hand over the time to Professor Go to uh, introduce herself and uh, get things rolling. Right. Hello. Thank you very much, Arka, and thank you, Said Singapore, for having me. My name is Geraldine Goeskolar, Jerry Goeskolar. Um, I'm adjunct associate professor at the Faculty of Law at the National University of Singapore. I have approximately 20 years of experience in the space and space-related industry. So I've worked in startups and uh, all the way through government and intergovernmental organizations. Um, after I did my law degree at NUS and uh, UCL and Leiden University, I decided the best thing to do was to go on a tour 
and see what, the, uh, what I could do with a law degree. Um, and so I found that you can use a law degree in a startup environment, uh, in in-house counsel. You can practice if you would like. Uh, you can work for government. You can work for international courts and tribunals. Um, and uh, you can also work for international legislative organizations. So I've done all of those um, in part to do also directly with space. I've had the privilege of working with the German Space Agency uh, with RapidEye that was then acquired by Planet, uh, which is an Earth observation location-based services satellites company. Um, and I've also had the uh, privilege of being with the Space Generation Advisory Council when I was much younger, and that was about a half a lifetime ago, and, uh, and which basically benefits from the input of people like you, young people who are passionate about space. So um, what I'm going to do today is talk to you about um, Singapore and where Singapore will stand in the uh, space environment. So let's maybe start here. We're little red dots and, and that's a pretty simple thing, but we're a little red dot on the pale blue dot. And I think that's the important thing that ultimately space does one special thing. And the one special thing is that it gives all of us something called a planetary identity. We belong on one planet and all of us, whether you know, you're know you a man or woman, you don't identify as a specific gender, whether you're from Singapore, father or field, all come from one planet. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about this five, uh, these five big issues in new space and what that means. Uh, then we're going to talk about space law and space policy and where that fits into building a space economy specific in Singapore. And when you look at that word cloud, you see basically that there are certain goals that we'd like to talk about. That's international peace and security, long-term sustainability. We'd like to have the responsible use of outer space. We'd like disruptive innovation and ethical entrepreneurship and the use of tech for good. And we're all basically focusing towards one aim and that's the benefit for all humanity. And when we then talk about this, uh, you start to see basically that there are further things that we can speak about, environmental protection, transparency and confidence building measures, state responsibility, continuing supervision, transparency, liability, resource use, all these legal and technical issues that we are facing today in the space ecosystem. So today we're going to be addressing all of this and you see the word cloud get more and more complicated, but that just shows you the panoply of, of uh, issues and things that we have to think about when we consider where Singapore's place is in the space economy. We then also look at special to Singapore. Uh, the tech adoption rate is one of them. The enablers that are existing in Singapore today, including the governments and other uh, parts of the infrastructure and economy. We talk about sovereign wealth, uh, data sovereignty, the question of the policy environment of Singapore and how Singapore can be a regional hub in achieving what you see in the middle, which is space law, space policy, tech for good uh, in the new space economy. So what is the context? Uh, the context is this, and it's a, it's a sad thing to look at, but you look at this, there's something called Earth Overshoot Day, and that is the date on which in the year we use more resources than the planet can replenish in the entire year. When you look at 1970, that date was December 29. It means it was pretty sustainable. Whatever was used in that year was generally replenished uh, by whatever was there in the year. In 2019, however, we see that the date is now the 1st of August. Today, uh, 2020, it will move again slightly into July. It means that by the end of July, we've used up more resources than the planet can replenish in the entire year. And this date is moving earlier and earlier. We're also seeing five mega trends in the last uh, two centuries or so. And these are the five. The first is rapid urbanization. Um, so a lot of people gathering in cities and the growth of uh, cities. We're seeing emerging global wealth. We're also seeing, of course, challenges related to climate change and resource scarcity. There's also a lot of demographic and social change. And, however, in the last two centuries, we have entered the age of technology and the technological breakthroughs are what we're seeing become more and more often, so much so that we're getting so used to it. When you think about it, this is my iPhone. It's an iPhone 10, not even the newest, and it's actually cracked. But when you see the iPhone, uh, you don't think about it, but 12 years ago, we didn't have the iPhone. I have two young children, uh, one seven and the other one is three, and they think that every screen that they see is a touch-enabled screen. They don't understand it when they come to my MacBook and they try very hard to move something, it doesn't move. And this is the generation that we're coming, um, that we're, we're raising today because they're so used to technological breakthrough. Also, what's special, of course, is that technological breakthrough is the mega trend that's evolving the fastest, and that's where space comes in. 
Now, many factors often accelerate the occurrence of a technological breakthrough. You see them there, but what's special is that you also see a lot of these in Singapore. The first is a significant demographic shift. We do have in Singapore an aging population, but we are also a global city that sees a lot of migration. Now, migrants compose approximately 3% of the world's population, but contribute to 9% of the global GDP. Now, we also need to have sustained economic growth in Singapore. We're a small country. We have very few natural resources that we can easily and readily call upon. We need to ensure our GDP grows, that we, the job market is secure. We want to look to investment, including foreign direct investment into the country. So we need to sustain that. What's special about Singapore, of course, is the innovative political environment that we're in. We're very pivotable. Singapore being small also has a pivotable legislative structure. Our legislation does also lower barriers to market entries in many industries. There's no reason why not space. And of course, in Singapore today, we're living this. Um, there are certain urgent societal needs. We're living the pandemic today. Um, the pandemic and COVID-19 has brought a lot of challenges um, and there are some fears as to what will happen. But the truth also is that the pandemic will, in that sense, provide uh, a motivating factor to make the next leapfrog. And so when we look at these sort of things, we see that we actually do have uh, certain factors in Singapore that could actually help in technological breakthrough, in particular in the space industry. So, but why are we talking about space? And what are we talking about when we say the global space economy? This is what we're talking about. 369 billion US dollars projected for this year, it will triple in the next 20 years to just over 1 trillion US dollars. And that's the size of the global space economy. No other economy globally grows so quickly. We also know that there are three major sectors that dominate the space economy today. The vast majority are downstream products and services, but we also need to look to upstream and midstream infrastructure. That takes about a quarter. And then, of course, the government services as well, which is its own, uh, in that sense, ecosystem. And there, I would like you to refer to that wonderful insight report you saw uh, Arka talk about. Um, that actually does split it up quite nicely in terms of where Singapore thinks about these, or what Singapore thinks about these issues. So have a look, uh, but it does very nicely split it up to these sectors. Now, McKinsey did a very interesting study a while ago, um, and the, the question that they asked was, what are the technology categories that have significant potential to improve key areas of well-being? And they categorized them. Now, you see the top three are data and artificial intelligence, connectivity and platforms, and robotics. And what's really interesting, of course, is that you see that a lot of data and connectivity platforms are space-based technologies. So today we're used to having these things coming from space through satellites. They're all space-bound technology. Robotics is a very interesting category. Of course, we've made a lot of significant jumps uh, in robotic technology in the space industry. Um, for example, I, I think just yesterday, Spacebit has um, signed a contract to create, uh, innovate space robotics for the NASA Artemis program. And that's actually quite interesting to see because we'll have very robust robotics technology being built for space hardened uh, hardware and that's something that we can also use on earth for things like telemedicine uh, for digital twinning for things like that so that's actually quite interesting now let's talk about space law um, and here's something's quite interesting when we're talking about space law space law is one field in a pretty large field called international law and we need to locate where it stands Singapore is a member of the international community and a member of the United Nations. It means that Singapore is bound by certain international obligations to other member states. Now, there's always this talk about how, okay, states are great and fine, but then we need to also then look at other actors, and we do. But the truth is that we're still a little bound to the Westphalian concept of state-to-state -state interaction. Now, Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice lists the sources of international law. And there they state international conventions and treaties, customary international law, and general principles of law. So this is what Singapore has to operate within. All right. And when we look at Singapore's laws and policies in the global space order, we see firstly that Singapore is a member of the international community. It means that it does have to take into account international obligations and the relationships between states. But also, Singapore can partake in the cooperation between states um, while taking into account certain geopolitical interests. 
Now, Singapore is a sovereign state. Um, and unfortunately for the little snafu on CNN yesterday, I think it was, uh, Singapore is a sovereign state, but that also means that we attract state responsibility in international law as well as international liability for damage caused by space activities. Singapore as a sovereign state also would have to exercise jurisdiction and certain control over its space objects. But then we narrow it down to Singapore's domestic considerations. There are economic priorities that we want to think about, the management of our resources, and how the domestic legislative framework can actually capture all of this in one picture. Of course, we also have incentives and policies to future-proof the economy, our workforce and infrastructure. We have certain national economic strategies, and we want to make sure that they have um, some impact, good impact, on the social and other challenges that our country faces. So the question then is, um, how would you achieve an agile space economy? And then we look at the goals that we'd like to have for space law and policy, and these are the six. The first is peace and security. As I mentioned, the question of international cooperation. And there we have something in space called the TCBMs, uh, one, one letter away from the ICBMs. They are the transparency and confidence building measures. Um, that work between countries. So the question of consultation between um, states, um, you know, at the diplomatic level, at the United Nations, we do have the framework of international law and space law treaties. And all of this also has to take into account the question of leading edge and dual use technology, because space, after all, is a military theater. So we have to think about that. Very importantly, we need to consider long-term sustainability. We need, to, um, have, we need to consider environmental protection. We and we also need to then decide what to do with our resources, the necessity of resources, the scarcity of the resources and the use of those resources. The Outer Space Treaty provides for the principle of due regard and also for this idea of the common heritage of mankind. So the use uh, of outer space, the exploration of outer space and the protection of the outer space environment is for the common heritage of mankind for this generation and for future generations to follow. We need to talk about responsible use. And there you see the, all the, uh, the structures there in the Outer Space Treaty. We call them in that sense the, the, the motherhood uh, treaty, the principles that we want to uh, take into account when we have space activities. And that's basically state responsibility to uh, authorize and continually supervise space activities by the nationals of a, spe of a specific state. There is liability for damage, and this we will come back to over and over again. Singapore is a contracting party to the Outer Space Treaty and to the Liability Convention. And what this means is that Singapore accepts liability for damage caused by its national space activities, whether those activities are conducted by a governmental or a non-governmental entity. What does this mean? It means that Singapore, if there's a link to Singapore from the, from the liability and the state responsibility point of view, Singapore will be responsible, it will be liable for damage. Now the liability convention is quite special. It gives liability to what is called the launching state. And of course, the first thing we have in mind is a country that has a launch pad and you set something up. But no, it goes further. It also gives liability to states that procure a launch. All right, or whose territory a thing is launched from or so on. So where there is a launch taking place, whether you procure it or so on, there comes liability. The other step of liability is this, there is absolute liability, that strict liability without regard to fault, where the damage occurs in the airspace or on the surface of the earth. This is very, very important. It does not matter whose fault it is. The point is there is state liability. There are other things for responsible use we need to discuss as well, registration and the question of jurisdiction and control over space objects, as well as safety and space worthiness certifications of space vehicles. And there we of course have crewed and uncrewed vehicles. And then we need to talk about the licensing structure, which then might probably take into account certain insurance considerations as well. Now the policy and legal goals also need to enable disruptive innovation. Now Dublin, which is a consulting uh, firm, came up with a very nice innovation wheel and there they came up with configuration offering experience. In order to move innovation, we need a profit model, a net network and structure and a process that configures the innovation and pushes it out to market. We need the offerings, that means the product performance and the product system to work well. And we need good experience, which means that we need to engage with the customer base. We need a good brand, a good channel and very good service. All of these 10 factors then push disruptive innovation. 
What does this mean for the law? We need to be careful, but we need not to be overly cautious. This is extremely important. Very overly cautious laws constrain innovation. That's not what we're looking for. Of course, more and more we're talking about ethical entrepreneurship. We're talking about entrepreneurship that has a social and community impact that considers this. And, um, and beyond resource efficiency, we also want to talk about best practices and corporate integrity. All this basically sows into a win-win business strategy. It isn't just about making money. Of course, it is about making money. That's what entrepreneurship is about. To be viable, you've got to make money, but you've got to make money with ethics in, in, in mind, which then, of course, leads us to tech for good. Um, those of you with Netflix uh, and the Netflix subscription will have heard of this uh, new documentary called The Social Dilemma. And basically it's this, this issue, the question of using technology for good social outcomes. We have a very high tech adoption rate in Singapore. And the question, of course, is how do we use this well? Now, we found um, that some 40 percent of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, so there's 17 of these SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, 40% of these goals are all linked to space technology, Earth observation, uh, global navigation systems, uh, and communications, and so on, to improve on these Sustainable Development Goals, to reach those Sustainable Development Goals, we rely so heavily on space-bound technology for the benefit of humanity, and that's tech for good, and that's fantastic. There are two other things, which is that tech can be good for smoothing disruption and for improving well-being. And we're seeing that today with COVID-19. What we're actually seeing is that space-based technology is helping to do three things. It's helping e uh, electronic health applications, a lot of e-health applications. It's helping to connect everyone. It's connecting me from uh, the Hague back into a whole bunch of people's uh, living rooms in Singapore. And it's also on top of that, um, making sure that the, the information is being disseminated in a manner that can be sustainable so people can get it quickly, uh, people can understand what's going on, and that kind of clear communication is enabled by space-bound technology. So that leads to the question, why Singapore? And those are the uh, five, uh, the, sorry, the ten most innovative economies in the world. You see Singapore up at number three. And why is Singapore up at number three? Um, well, basically because we have very strong tertiary efficiency. It means that we have very high enrollment in higher education. And that's why Singapore is considered one of the top 10 most innovative economies in the world. What's most interesting is that we are regularly, so consistently in the top 10. So we go from three to six and back up, but we're at three this year uh, and we're doing pretty well. Now, why is that? We are also outranking the top two, Germany and South Korea in STEM education. We have very high tertiary uh, efficiency and we're increasing and ramping up R&D. And that's really why it's important. This was released by the United States and the US is slightly worried because 15% of their students pursue natural science degrees, which is far less, 15% um, than what we see, for example, in Singapore, which is nearly treble, basically what we see in the United States. But what we also see in Singapore is that the uptake is much higher than other nations that have space capacity, such as France and China. Why again Singapore? Because Southeast Asia is a pretty large economy with 300 billion in projected market value. We have a lot of people here, some 650 million, uh, and of course a, a, a huge middle class that's expected to increase. And Singapore is the first in the world for attracting talent. So even if we do not have the technology and talent that is homegrown at the moment, which I don't think we don't have any, I think we just need to really nurture them. We find the mentors, they come, they come to Singapore. We also have a lot of venture capital funds, quite a few accelerators based here. And that's why Singapore is a very good, not just regional, but global hub for the global space economy. Which leads to the interesting question, how can Singapore lead? And now uh, Bloomberg did a, a very nice survey and they came up with these seven policies that feed an innovative economy. Their R&D intensity, patent activity, manufacturing value add, tertiary efficiency, productivity, high tech density and researcher concentration. Of course, our question is, how can Singapore shape an innovative space based economy through its policy and law? I bring you back to that. And so what kind of policies would feed a new space economy? The first is R&D intensity, which is defined as the annual research and development spending as the percentage of an economy's GDP. What can Singapore do? It already does very well, which is the increase to increase and to keep basically sustaining annual R&D spending for activities that focus on the space industry. 
Um, to do that, we also provide support for new tech industries, including subsidies, tax incentives, investment, and continuing education. What's really important is this. It's very hard to scale up an operation for new tech. People don't want to scale up new tech. They want tech that's already been demoed, so really a, a technical demonstration that's already worked, we're sure the technology works, then we put some money in. But how do you get there? From the moment of the idea to the invention to the actual demonstration, there is a huge path in between and we need to then start thinking about what happens earlier on. Now, the second thing is patent activity, and that's defined by the number of annual patent grant filings uh, and the three-year average growth uh, filings abroad, all right? So what Singapore can do is grow home-based talent and attract talent can innovate, that can innovate, but go one step further, which is to create incentives for innovation and inventions that are marketable IP. So the intellectual property is marketable. And what you will see actually is that we, we've actually found that um, there are quite a lot of companies that are sitting on a lot of IP that earns a lot of money. Um, Boeing, for example, sits on approximately $1 billion worth of it. Um, and so this is quite interesting. So there we need to be aware, of course, overly cautious policies and laws uh, and provide incentive to subject matter experts uh, so that they can come and think about such IP that we can commercialize and market for the space economy. The third one's manufacturing value add, and that refers to manufacturing output levels as a percentage of the GDP and per capita. And there, I think Singapore is already known as a hub for manufacturing, and we need to pivot our manufacturing capacity towards the new space economy. That allows us to future-proof Singapore's manufacturing capacity. For example, in the 70s and 80s, we were known for becoming a hub for semiconductor industry semiconductor manufacturing. We still have that kind of capacity and we just have to pivot towards the new industry. So how do we build satellites on a mass production basis? Uh, how can we move quantum communications? All that kind of stuff, we need to look into our, into our manufacturing capacity and what we can do. The fourth one, we do already very well, tertiary efficiency, and that's a total enrollment in higher education of the, of the share of labor force with advanced education levels. And there, of course, we're doing very well, but we need to continue investing in tertiary and in particular in cross-disciplinary research and degrees. And we need to emphasize future-proof skills from early primary and secondary education. We're starting to do this now, but the emphasis on dual degrees and on STEAM education is also very important uh, because it's the arts, actually, that does fuel several things, marketing channels, branding, customer satisfaction, and on top of that, the creativity that makes us go a little further. The next one's productivity, and that's the GDP and gross national income in the working age population. Um, and here, I think we just need to do this. We need to acknowledge the need to keep the working age population in sync with the future space-based economy. We need to factor in space-based tech and nationwide productivity policies. And I'll give you an example here. Very recently, Australia announced a 1.5 billion Australian dollar plan to revitalize new manufacturing. And space is one of the six, uh, six industries or sectors that the Australian government's looking into. The acknowledgement of the need to include space as part of the new manufacturing um, sectors that we're looking at as a, as a nation is very important. Then we look to high tech density, and that's the volume of domestic or high tech uh, public companies as a share of the total companies in the world. And here, of course, we have our Smart Nation initiative, uh, but we need to keep in mind the significance of the new space industry. We need to cross-fertilize smart tech with, uh, with space tech uh, and see what we can do in terms of creating homegrown companies and homegrown talents that can contribute to the space economy in Singapore. Researcher concentration is the last thing, and that brings them back to tertiary efficiency and R&D uh, intensity. And that's the number of professionals engaged in R&D across the population. We need encouragement and engagement among universities and research institutions to work with commercial entities and policies that incentivize companies to allot more time for R&D activities, right? And one of the things, R&D sometimes has a very long runway before you actually get money back. And we need to somehow incentivize that through tax breaks or, or, or some subsidies, but this must be done in order to ensure that we have proper R&D. These are the policies that enable long-term success. Right in the middle, the ikigai of the whole thing, we look at ecosystem risk, tech breakthroughs, and the economy's policy and legal responses to mega trends. 
And these are the mega trends. We've talked about R&D. We need to increase sovereign and private investment in Singapore-based um, uh, space R&D. And these are the ideas that I have. Um, obviously, more, more ideas can come from a lot of you, and I won't go through all of them. But what we actually need is a conducive and stable ecosystem that includes attracting talent and tax breaks or incentives, and actually supporting, not just initiating, but supporting R&D hubs and accelerator programs. We need to future-proof our workforce uh, in the new space economy. We need to cross-fertilize uh, interdisciplinary work. We need to create incentives for both technological and soft skills training. It's absolutely terrifying how much of us are so reliant on computers and cannot actually program one. It's really, really terrifying. I mean, I think everyone should, from early education onwards, start having exposure to Python and to various different uh, programming languages to understand even the legal concepts of, of uh, what happens with, with uh, data across borders or the logic of uh, programming things. Today, in uh, certain um, sectors of the law, we're talking about not just the rule of law, but the rule of code because code is one very objective way by which you can run law. And this is the sort of interdisciplinary fertilization of ideas that we need to have to future-proof our workforce. We need to focus on shifts in consumer demand. We need to have policies that create clear pathways between innovation all the way through to commercialization. We have to attract mobile capital, technology, and people. But most importantly, we need to create cradle to grave and 360 expertise which include things like fundraising, dispute settlement cap uh, capacities, uh, you know, things like all the way through. So it's not just a one-stop um, sector that we focus at. We need to focus at really at a 360 view of uh, what the consumer demands today. And of course, we need policies that are in tune with current and future societal plans. And there basically um, is where the young people come in. Uh, we need to create laws that leverage space tech for good social impact. And we need to then engage the space generation, which is most of you guys, um, to link space assets, tech and resources with societal needs. So quite quickly, I'm just going to run through the sectors. Uh, I had a question quite early on, which basically is, um, aside from set satellites, what can Singapore focus on? It's a good question. There are four big sectors, all right, infrastructure, products and services, government, and what I call enablers. These are all the things you can do besides satellites. Uh, of course, you can manufacture the satellite, and there the interesting thing will be mass production of satellites through mass manufacturing. But there are also other things, launches, for example, launch platforms and services, um, transfer vehicles. So after you know a, a, a satellite gets sent up to outer space, you've got to inject it into its orbit, those transfer vehicles. Station keeping, operations and maintenance. Um, I, am, I am aware of a couple of Singaporean startups that are thinking about tether technology, uh, station keeping, which doesn't involve propulsion. It's, it's very interesting that text that coming up that we need to also look at. Uh, in terms of transfer vehicles, I think it was the um, very recently, I mean, basically there's been a sale of a, a transfer vehicle startup that is a unicorn, has been valued at over 1 billion US dollars. Um, and that's something that we need to look at as well. Ground stations is the other thing. So you can't just send the thing up and, and you know, and cross your fingers and hope everything goes fine. You gotta take care of it from the ground. And there's a whole ground station infrastructure as well that we could get ourselves into. There are products and services, and um, more and more as we, we um, as every day comes by. Obviously, there's the space tourism issue. Uh, there's satellite internet connectivity, Earth observation, and the use of artificial intelligence in EO data. There's point-to-point -point transport, which now most people think is what Virgin Galactic's pointing at, uh, and that basically is uh, the equivalent of taking a plane. But you don't take a plane; you go through suborbital, and you get there faster, basically. Um, if this works, you can get from London down to Singapore in less than half an hour. And this basically is what we're talking about, point-to-point -point transport. Obviously, there's comms that we can talk about, but different kinds of, of uh, communications. Location-based services. Um, I am old enough to remember actually having to drive through the United States with a big paper map in my hand. Um, and that's how old I am. But now, obviously, location-based services, we're pretty used to it. People now drive their cars into lakes and rivers because Google Maps said to do so. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting more and more reliant on this sort of products and services. Now, interestingly, direct broadcasting is one of them. So the thing that you're seeing streaming to your iPad or to, to your uh, Galaxy Samsung thing, I'm an iPerson. So um, it, it's basically, it does run through a satellite system. There are two other very interesting technologies and industries coming up. The first is space-based manufacturing. Uh, and there, there is huge uh, applications, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry, where you need to create crystals of particular purity. 
And there you can do it in outer space. And of course, the space resource mining and extraction. Now in government, national security is one big thing. Um, and uh, interestingly, I think yesterday or the day before, SpaceX and L3 Harris just signed a $342 million contract with the United States uh, Space Development Agency. Uh, and on the 1st of October, US Space Force uh, signed a $298 million contract to Boeing uh, to make its uh, satellite um, capacities non-hackable. So you see a lot of national security issues there, government contractors, but also we see a push towards smart nation initiatives, in particular for the digital economy and for public services. Which brings us to the enablers. And these are the venture capital companies more and more pivoting towards looking at space based, uh, space uh, bound technology and startups. We look at insurance because of the amount of liability that this actually considers. Insurance is really important. And their policy consultancies, lobbies, certification standard boards, and education. All of this enable the space ecology. So I have five uh, case studies, and given the time, I won't go through all five. So I just propose to go through about three of them, if you'll bear with me. And the first one is space tourism, launch infrastructure, and point-to-point -point transport. Now, space tourism and hospitality is the thing that gets most people's attention these days. But as of July of 2019, approximately 560 people have been to space, of which only eight were tourists. Um, and uh, what we do see, however, is different kinds of space tourism. So in 2001, Dennis Taito paid 20 million, was the first space tourist in orbit. And uh, today you could buy a ticket on a 90 minute suborbital flight with Virgin Galactic for approximately a quarter of a million dollars. That's one eighth year of the amount that you would have to spend you know, from the very beginning. Of course, a different kind of experience. What's interesting, of course, is Virgin Galactic is a publicly traded company and is doing pretty well, actually, its stocks. Now, of course, there's also point-to-point -point transfer. This is SLS. Um, it's not just crude, it's also uncrewed that we are talking about. Um, but this is what we're interested in as well, point-to-point -point transfer of people, basically from spaceport A to spaceport B. There's nothing particularly uh, technologically groundbreaking about this. It's like aviation, essentially. Get on a plane, get off the plane, different place. So get on a spaceship, get off the spaceship, different place on Earth, same thing. Um, but of course, we need to have different spaceports. Uh, and you see, of course, in uh, New Mexico, outside of the town of truth or consequences, we already have the Virgin Galactic um, uh, Spaceport America. And the question is, where else can we build spaceports in the world for this? Now, there's a bunch of policy and legal issues to consider. The first two, of course, being Singapore's international obligations under the Outer Space Treaty, the Rescue Agreement Agreement and the Liability Convention. Now, also Singapore's position as an aviation and shipping hub is very important. Remember the little point about how there's absolute liability for damage in airspace and on the surface of the earth? Now, imagine if you go and put something out and you don't consider the liability question. So you don't buy insurance. All right. And I don't know, you or I, or, you know, as a Singapore national, I decide I would like to launch something. And I launch one of those little missiles intending to get something to outer space and God forbid it hits a plane or it smashes into a ship on, on the surface of the earth. Absolute liability, does not matter whose fault it is. What does this mean? It means that if we have a spaceport located in an area where there are lots and lots of planes flying and we are one of the most busy corridors aviationally wise uh, in the world, we need to consider these things. It's not that it's impossible it's just something we need to consider when we make our laws and our policies. We need to put a framework in place that considers these things. All right. We also need to consider the environmental impact, including the impact on space debris. Um, we also consider space traffic management and governance, as well as safety certification for both crewed and uncrewed vehicles. Now, government and smart nation initiatives still take up a huge proportion of, uh, of uh, the space economy. And here, basically, let's look at the highest global spenders in terms of military spending. And you see, of course, the, the use of suspects. So military isn't going to go away. Yeah. But we also use basically space-based uh, space technology to do other things. This is an Earth observation picture taken on the 23rd of August 2018 from NASA. And it shows you a bunch of different things that could help first responders, wildfire smoke, typhoons incoming, hurricanes, agricultural burning, the dust from the Sahara. We can look at all of this from space-based technology. And with that kind of data, we can then allocate resource and, and responses better. 
We also have smart cities. And um, from smart city spending, basically, we've seen that a lot of these uh, growth rates are basically is growing, smart city spending. And what's good about smart cities is that it allows for better emergency responses. And so it protects the general wealth uh, and health and well-being, well-being of the general population. It, of course, increases better uh, access to good transport and logistics. Um, it also then, for example, with uh, smart roads and smart technologies, which are satellite enabled, it can shave up to 30 minutes of the daily commute on average for everybody. Imagine how much we save in terms of air pollution. Just that, all right, on top of the fuel and all that kind of cost. Now, health. Um, Smart cities also tackle chronic diseases. It can use the data to fight preventable disease. It improves patient engagement and is really great for pandemic management. So having the connectivity between us, all of this is space-based, is really great for health in general. And of course, it's good for the environment. Uh, with technological applications, we can cut emissions, we reduce waste, we save up to lots of water per person per day. But here are some policy and legal issues to consider. Um, obviously the same thing again, the dual use technology and Singapore's international obligations to keep space a peaceful theater. There are certain national security issues that we must also consider uh, in terms of the data that we're showing. There's a question of data sovereignty and the issues related to connectivity across borders. What happens when the data leaves your border and ends up uh, in the jurisdiction of another country? Those are legal and policy things that we need to think about. We need to have a framework in place. There are certain, certain privacy issues uh, linked to connectivity and the data that's being used and how we use that data. And of course, we need to integrate with other government agencies and public services. And lastly, because it's a fun, cool, sexy uh, topic, that's the space resource extraction issue. And as the global population continues to increase, we're now looking at different ways to get resources necessary for life on Earth. Now, mining nearby asteroids uh, is, uh, is a possible solution towards eliminating resource scarcity. If space is infinite and the number of bodies in the, uh, in the universe is infinite, it means that these resources are also infinite. And we can get out of this scarcity mindset into an abundance mindset because there's so much out there. What's great about this, the knock on is there's no more fight on resources. If we could just get these things and come back and use those things, there's an infinite amount of them out there. That's a great thing. Now, we can also move pollution off planet. That's a questionable thing, whether we want to pollute something else or we won't pollute here. The only thing is right now, we only have planet A. There is no planet B. So right now, we need to protect planet A, and that's our priority. Uh, and of course, we need to provide a reliable supply. So these are the other solutions, uh, possible, um, possible solutions to these issues, resource extraction from outer space. Now, small asteroids could have billions of dollars worth of metals which are precious to us, platinum, the metals that go into your smartphone. Instead of having strip mining all over, instead of having children mine them, which we shouldn't do anyway to begin with, we could actually have them on asteroids, uh, get them, capture them and bring them back. Um, now, how about water? A lot of asteroids carry water and that also can help with the water scarcity issue. A bunch of other policy uh, issues and legal issues to consider. One, Singapore's obligations under the Outer Space Treaty. And here I have to repeat it again. Just because it's inconvenient and you don't like it doesn't mean it stops being the law. All right. So being an international uh, member of the international community is a bit like driving on a highway. You may not agree with all the traffic rules. You may think some traffic rules are stupid, but you can't just break them because you're going to get yourself involved in a crash. All right, so there are different obligations in the Outer Space Treaty. In particular, in Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty, there's a prohibition on the appropriation, on appropriation in general in outer space. Then the question comes, can you extract resources and use them without appropriating the, something in outer space? So without appropriation, can you extract and then take ownership over that thing that you've ex extracted? Some countries say yes. Most countries haven't made a, 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 haven't said anything specific about it, but we need to know, Singapore, where are we going? Um, where, what is our stance on non-appropriation? What is our stance on resource extraction? The law at the moment is Article 2, prohibition on the appropriation in outer space. We need to consider liability, insurance, the licensing framework, the environmental impact. And sometimes it sounds fun. Now we're talking about asteroids, um, capture them and okay, we, we, we use them, that's fine. Now imagine we try to mine the moon. Now, the moon has cultural significance to quite a lot of the cultures on Earth. Now, imagine we to, to mine half of the moon away, uh, and the thing that you look at in the sky no longer looks like what you're used to. What is the cultural and religious impact that that would have on cultures across the world? Is that something we should consider policy-wise, legal-wise? 
is the Earth, for example, uh, something that is so important to protect that we can do something like that to the moon? It's all these things that we have to consider. Is the moon a UNESCO World Heritage Site? Uh, are the Apollo landing sites uh, World Heritage Sites? Are those cultural property? What do we do with all this stuff? There's a whole bunch of international policy and legal issues to consider on top of the property issue. All right, I'm going to stop here in terms of the, um, the case studies and basically show you this word cloud, which basically shows you the overlapping issues that we have to consider when we talk about space law and policy in Singapore. We want to basically focus on the top and bottom things that we're looking at, benefit for all humanity, responsible use, long-term sustainability, all of this wrapped around in a nice little package that we call the space economy with the enabling basket that we call space policy and law in the little dot on earth that we call Singapore. So this is it, benefit for Singapore, benefit for all humanity. That's the idea of the space economy. I'm gonna thank you very much here and then give it back to Arka. Thank you, thank you Prabhu. It was, uh, it was very, very informative and uh, entertaining uh, lecture. Uh, and then, yeah, and then the part you ended off on is something I really never thought about before the moon. Uh, and uh, the significance of mining on it. I know there's a nonprofit called For All Moonkind, and uh, their name was what got me, and their main purpose is to preserve the uh, first steps of man on the moon. And uh, they don't really care what else is really done, but that place has to be there. And I think um, those are just some interesting issues that, you know, like even 20 years ago, you would not have thought would be ever part of any conversation, you know? So I think that's it's really cool. And um, on bringing people in, about a lot of different uh, issues, yeah. So um, maybe before, uh, so in this part, we will uh, do a Q&A and uh, the, the floor is open to uh, anyone who wants to ask, but before, before I hand it over to the floor, um, uh, may I just uh, remind you everyone of the uh, etiquette? Uh, if you do have a question, uh, please wait until the previous person who is asking or until Professor Go finishes answering that person's question and uh, then unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and, and ask the question. Uh, put the questions on the chat uh, as well. That's the other alternative and uh, we will get to them as soon as we can. Yeah. So maybe I'll get the ball rolling with um, one question that was uh, sent beforehand uh, and uh, it's relevant to what we have now and I think uh, uh, Prof. Go touched on it very briefly. Um, it's about COVID-19 and we, we found that uh, from some of our interviews with during the Insights Report, we found that COVID-19 has impacted uh, different space companies in different ways. And there is a lot of reliance on satellite technologies to keep the world connected. Some, some satellite companies are seeing growth in business as well. How else do you think COVID-19 may impact the space industry and other big international endeavors and projects such as the Artemis project? Uh, thanks, Arko. That's a very good question. I think when it comes to COVID, um, the, the impact is actually, I, I think we're only beginning to see the impact uh, of COVID because we are no, not taking into account the long-term effects of what will happen in terms of pandemic response, not just uh, globally in terms of the states, but also in individuals, you and me, for example. Um, and there in particular, I, I think it's quite interesting. There was, a, there was a report out, I think, the week before last, uh, which basically talked about the three industries that are expected not to shrink in 2020, despite the pandemic. They are, as you might imagine, medicine and pharmaceuticals, that makes sense, uh, streaming and entertainment, that also makes sense, and the space industry. That, those are the three that are not going to shrink this year. Um, there was then, I think, last week, um, and uh, I think an article out that basically said the United States is slightly worried that they will lose quite a few of the space startups. Um, and it really has to do with timing. So for example, New York State's course just actually gave the green light for one web to carry on under a different structure. I think this was just this past week. Uh, but it's one of those things, if your IPO is at the wrong time, uh, it's not going to do so well, is it? Um, and of course, there's a the question of where the banks put the money. So then soft banks starts to be a little bit more cautious and you start to see then some, some pivots in terms of what people will do with their money. Um, so there is some concern about that. But, but the truth is, I think if you look at it, um, we have 26,000 approximately uh, trackable items in orbit right now, approximately 27, 2800 functioning satellites. 
Over the next five years, just the United States itself, there are some 20,000 satellites that are going to be launched. That has not changed and the timeline has not changed. China expects another 13,000 satellites to be launched in LEO for the next uh, five to 10 years. And actually in the United States as of today, we see approximately 51,000 51, satellites with approved licensing for their uh, bandwidth and, and uh, communications frequencies. I think it was Robert Firetech that had a fantastic um, blog post the other day. And he says that the appetite for space that he sees in the public, you know, it's just, it's just been majestic. It's a thing that has not abated. Um, and we're starting to see how important it is, all this technology that we have and how to use the technology that we have as a tool to help us deal with the pandemics, to reach areas which are harder to reach, uh, to have telemedicine, uh, to connect just, you know, people across. It's also very important for mental health. So we're starting only to see the effects. So I don't think we're going to see, in that sense, a terrible downturn. There might be a dip, but I think there won't be a terrible downturn. For the big projects like Artemis, Moon to Mars, I don't think there will be a massive impact. Um, for example, I think just uh, last week or the week before last, um, there was released on YouTube and Twitter a wonderful new documentary on the making of JUICE, which is the European Space Agency's uh, mission to Jupiter's icy moons. And there the project manager is basically saying, well, you know, it doesn't impact. Uh, we have a certain window, we're going to launch that window, and we're going to push towards that window, basically. Um, and people are continuing to work, quite, quite ironically, with the very big projects. Um, these big companies have more resources as well to deal with COVID. Um, and the truth is, when you're building a satellite, it's probably the cleanest place on Earth at the moment. So, you know, with all the caps and all the gowns and everything, it's a really nice clean room. Uh, so there we are. I, I think like it will impact, uh, but I think that as we learn to deal with this crisis, the space tech and the space economy actually is going to help us um, rather than actually have a negative impact. Um, I'm All seeing right. a lot of questions on the chat. Yes. Uh, yeah. Would you like me to take them one by one? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> I think the first one is by uh, Mr. Marvin Lim uh, from Ingenious. Yes. Uh, about the launch path across the other country, are there any legal issues uh, that might be in there? Right. Uh, thank you, Marvin from Ingenious. Uh, and first, before I answer the question, I'm going to apologize to Shushmita. Um, I do speak very quickly. I think I've known as Speedy Gonzalez, where I come from. Um, so we'll try to speak a little uh, slow. I get really excited, and so I keep mm -hmm. talking. So Marvin, I see Marvin. Thank you for turning your video on. It's nice to see you. Um, yes, with a launch path across a, a lot of countries, yes, there are different legal issues. And the first thing, of course, is basically the flight. So to get from the surface of the Earth to outer space, you need to get through airspace. Airspace is something that we have sovereignty issues over, um, which explains two things. You will see, for example, that the United States launches over the high seas, essentially. So they come off Florida and they go towards uh, the ocean. You will see Kazakhstan and Baikonur, of course, launches over the steppes, basically, um, for two reasons. One, no population over those areas or fewer population. The, the likelihood that you hit somebody is, is much lower. Uh, two, also, you get into international um, high seas or into a, a steppe, basically, which, which you can regulate with Russia. And so, yes, there are a lot of issues. When you're trying to get a path across other countries, especially from Singapore, uh, you start to run quite quickly into the airspace of other countries around us. I think we don't get to fly more than I think, 30 seconds or something before we hit uh, another country's airspace. It means that we have to coordinate with the other countries. It also means a lot of transparency and confidence building measures so that basically if you're a neighboring country, you've got to be quite sure that the thing that Singapore launches, it's a civil thing. It's not meant to be a military aggressive act, basically. Um, and of course, then the question is what happens with all the aviation that, that is in that airspace? And you need to coordinate that in terms of air traffic management, space traffic management uh, as well. Now, aside from that, when we launch across other countries, across populated areas, there's the question of what happens if it goes wrong. And there is the strict liability rule that applies across uh, board for international obligations. Anything that hits something and causes damage in the airspace or on the surface of the earth invokes strict liability. And those are the basic issues that we will actually have to consider. Uh, um, I, I, was, I was actually the guy that brought in the, um, the uh, Airbus hypersonic space plane demonstrator project to Singapore uh, and have done um, a few other projects. Uh, more recently is to try to send the Singaporean to space using stratospheric balloon. Uh, let me shoot a, um, a more direct question. Uh, 
a, a, a real case. Okay. Um, let's say we want to launch a rocket from Singapore. Okay, let's be naughty about it, right? Now, who do you think? I mean, one north, uh, how should I say, one degree, and then we are going north, all right? So, who do you think, which country do we need to start to talk with first? Because the first corridor will be probably up to IKO, 20,000, okay? So, uh, a certain country is involved, and then later on, we're going to stratosphere, which is then going to the space authority. So, from your expertise, let's say I'm asking you, okay, for some reason, I want to launch, uh, I have been given permission to launch from the local authority, let's say, which is also difficult, but let's say we got that. Who do we need to talk to next? Okay, um, it's a good question, Marvin. Thank you for the question. I mean, yeah. when, you get, when you say you get the authorities uh, authorization to launch, yeah. uh, I, I'm going to assume this being Singapore, that they've done their homework and the local uh -huh. authorities have gone and talked to all these other people as well. Okay. Um, one of the issues, of course, is that when we're talking about uh, a lot of this, let's say a lot of these negotiations carry on at a certain level. So it's really between designated um, delegates from certain countries and they, they have to discuss that. It is important, yes, the IKO 2000 and of course uh, the southern state, uh, you know, and if you're going further up north, it also depends yeah. on the trajectory that you're taking. So Correct. basically, uh, Correct. you know, the angle of launch. Um, and so basically how long it's, it's going to be within the atmosphere. The truth is once you get to 100 kilometers, you are in principle, you're in space, you're fine. Uh, and there you coordinate with the United Nations through the Secretary uh, General. Mm -hmm, to the mm -hmm. Office of the Space Affairs in Vienna. Uh, okay. Then, then lays, lays a whole other bunch of questions. For example, do you have a national registry? I think Singapore is one of those. Um, it was actually also highlighted in the Insights report. We need to have a registry quickly, please, because I think we have 14 SATs already up. Um, we need to coordinate with that. We need to coordinate with ITU before any of this happens. This years and years ahead, I'm assuming you've talked to ITU because you need comms channels with your um, the yep. thing that you're launching. Um, you will need to talk, assuming that you have authorization from the authorities in Singapore, they would have spoken with the, their neighbours and so on. They probably would have told the so, neighbourhood side. Right? Yeah. Um, otherwise, if they have not and they have authorised, then they're in a little bit of trouble because um, you, you need to coordinate the sort yeah. of thing. So in specific, in this example, mm. who do I talk to in Singapore to start? And then I think the next people will be the people in... Uh, Malaysia, right? But let's yeah. say in Singapore, so if, if you are the one, let's say I get you to be my my director or my shareholder or whatever, okay? Who will you, who will you, who will you talk to? Who will you talk to? Tell me, tell me. Uh, I actually, I, I kind of know most of the answer, but I'd like to hear from... Oh, you're somebody. evil. Somebody that's, that's a terrible evil question. No, 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 no. it's important. Different person. Okay, yeah. uh, the civil aviation, the people you really need to talk to, so CAS, you have to speak to. Okay. Um, depending also on where you are launching from, uh, because okay. of Changi Airport, basically. Sure. Uh, civil aviation, so our CAS also has a seat at ICAO, together with all the different agencies, so they probably can coordinate there, so there will be a good shot sure. of call, right? Um, I would say you need to talk to Minlaw AGC as well, um, okay. because they are the ones that deal with our international obligations abroad. Um, they will then do the the coordination. I mean, I think what's great about Singapore is that our ministries speak very well to each other. Um, so unlike certain other countries, which where you know the the, the the paper doesn't leave the desk, in Singapore it, it circulates quite quite quickly compared to some other countries. So I think they would have spoken to those as well. I don't know if you're looking for or fishing for any other uh, agencies you want me to point you to. Mm. Uh, but I think one of the issues, and I think you are uh, focusing on that actually is uh, there, there is no one unified structure to go to. We don't have a space agency. Is there a, uh, sorry. Hi, sorry, I think. Is there a sorry. particular office to talk to in CAS? Or? Um, I don't think there's a specific office, but I mean, I think you, you have to talk to aviation basically. So the people that do the, the air traffic management. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, for, go for that. I'll move on to the next, uh, another question that was raised um, mm -hmm. by Mr. Charles. So he's uh, from Photonicity. Uh, he's the CEO of Photonicity over here. Okay. Um, he asked if we can get insurance, uh, but we're not extracting uh, resources, presumably. Um, what, are there still other legal concerns for operating in space? I am, I'm assuming, uh, Mr. Charles, you can correct me, but I'm assuming he means uh, in space exploration uh, in that context. 
All right. Uh, all right. Thank you, Mr. Hall, for that question. So that's assuming we are not extracting any resources from anywhere and we have insurance. So we're, we're good and we have insurance. What are the other legal concerns for operating in space? Um, the first thing, is when, when you say the legal concerns, I, I'm assuming that you're talking about it from a private entity point of view. Uh, so what concerns would a private entity have? Um, now, usually when a private entities get very much involved in the space economy, usually what the states do is that they quickly start to put legislation in place. Because if they don't do that, they would still in any way be internationally responsible for the activities of their nationals. All right, so, so that's basically the first thing. Now, from a, com from a company's point of view, that means that usually there is a licensing structure in place, usually. Um, and, um, and then you need to go and deal with whichever government um, entity it is that, that deals with that. In terms of legal concerns, uh, I think if there you, you com conflate both legal, social impact, uh, you know, policy type issues for operating in space, you are talking also about getting your own um, communications channels. So you need to go talk to the ITU. You need to uh, consider whether what you are doing is allowed by the country that you are seated in. So those are the legal concerns, if you will. There are certain IP issues. You might want to consider data sovereignty is another question. Um, you might want to consider what happens across borders, how you would retrieve an object if it's basically been lost somewhere on the planet or, or outside of that. In some countries, uh, depending on who you're, you're launching with or who you're working with, there are certain legal uh, requirements for environmental impact. It means that, for example, part of your satellite has to reserve fuel for end of life, um, basically um, disposal. You've got to boost it up or do something with it. Uh, so, yes, there, I mean, I think that the, the short answer to your question is yes, there are still a lot of legal concerns for operating in space. And that's just uncrewed, right? If you have crewed vehicles, there's a whole bunch of, a uh, whole universe of other questions you want to look at as well. Uh, safety, human safety rated uh, vehicles. Uh, what happens with um, liability? Can you actually buy insurance for something that's so ultra hazardous, that sort of thing? So, short answer, yes, there are a whole bunch of other legal concerns. Long answer, let's have a coffee and talk about this and I can go on for hours if you'd like. All right, thank you, Franco. Uh, I think the next question is uh, from one of our own from the Space Policy Unit. Uh, it's from Shansung. I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, hi, Rob. Uh, thanks for the very insightful speech. Uh, you mentioned that there is a need for cross fertilization of uh, space technologies. And businesses. So, uh, how can we actually market the benefit of space tech and encourage you know, itself to take into the other industries when these businesses don't even possess the metrics for evaluation? That's a very good question. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Lim. Um, it's, yes, there is a need. I think there's a serious need to cross-fertilize space with technology and businesses. And basically, the, the, the easiest way to do it is to show them that they can either they need it or they can do things better, cheaper, faster with it, basically. When you're talking about businesses, um, businesses generally have to care about one thing, whether it's a, it's a small business or they have uh, shareholders, and that is to make money. If you don't make money, you're not a business, basically. You're a charity or whatever, but you're not a business. So you, if you show them something that you can do quicker, faster, better, you increase basically the possibility for profit and also you increase the profit margin. So if you show them that you can do that, that's basically when the metrics will appear, basically. The other thing, of course, is that you can make the metrics for them. Um, you know, they may not have the metrics to evaluate, so you make it yourself. Um, and that's where a lot of these lobbies and consult consultancies come in, which is the, the category I have called enablers, basically. Um, there are quite a lot of institutes that look at this and see how it can be done better. So, for example, um, internet connectivity. You could do it different ways. You could use optic fibers, for example, and lay the, the cables across, across the seabed. You can perfectly do that. It means that if you live in a coastal region, you have probably very good internet connectivity. If you live inland, different story altogether, right? But if you show them that there are different ways that you can use satellite connectivity, you can actually decrease the cost of data, that sort of thing, I think that the businesses would actually up, uh, have, have quite great interest and the uptake wouldn't be an issue. Um, so it's a matter of basically not space as the ends, but space as the means towards achieving an end. All right. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, so one, just give me one second. All right. Uh, the next one, which I think is a uh, fairly, uh, fairly uh, general question, but I think just as important for space like Singapore is uh, by UDMH. Um, how can space companies in non-superpower countries, so let's say Singapore, um, Stay, uh, stay afloat or make a profit without large government contracts because we know that governments still play, a, no matter how much commercialization, privatization we're heading into, still play a very integral role in this industry. 
how would space companies do that in a place like Singapore? Or it's very in a non -super um, the You are right that basically a lot of the big space companies, they are afloat, they make a profit because of government linked contracts. So SpaceX, for example, is, is one really great example. Um, they, of course, had a huge injection of capital. Um, but, um, but the point also is that they are continually getting a lot of government linked contracts. Now, in a country like Singapore, which is a, a non superpower country, I think uh, if you read the insights report that said Singapore put together, there was one respondent that referred to Singapore as an emerging superpower. I'm not quite sure where the government's going with this, but uh, but if you, if you look at it as a smaller country where it doesn't you know have huge DOD or NASA contracts, uh, what can you do with that? Um, firstly, so in Europe, for example, there is this thing, and it ties into the question about cooperation. The European Space Agency is a vehicle that does exactly that. So you have smaller European countries who are not the big super house like um, Italy or Germany or France. Um, the little ones are basically banding together. So they put the money together in a pot. And the, the way that the European Space Agency does it is that for every euro that goes into the pot from a country, a euro comes back in terms of either contracts or, or technology transfer or something like that. All right, and that's one way to do it. Now, usually you get more than a euro. So the Netherlands, where I live, gets approximately six euros for every one euro it invests into the European Space Agency, six euros. That's like the best return on investment you can find anywhere in the market. All right, um, so that's one way to do it. You can do it through international cooperation. So uh, and when you look at that, basically you have quite a lot of countries that are not big superpowers, but they can band together. That's the first thing. Uh, the other thing, of course, is, is to make it commercially interesting for the big multinational corporations. Um, so for example, if you can make the uh, tel telecom satellites last a longer time, if you can uh, refuel, if you can somehow, you know, fix this problem, or you can help, for example, reinsurance companies deal with the space debris issue, uh, that would be the niche market that you would look into. So you could stay afloat, you could make a profit, maybe, uh, you know, a little bit harder because you're not one of uh, these um, nationals of these big superpowers, but it's possible, I do think. The other way, of course, is to work with those big, large government contractors, um, because obviously the government contractors also subcontract. Um, and that's one possibility here as well. With the United States, you run into the specific issue of ITAR, that's the International Traffic Arms Regulation, which does not allow certain entities to deal with certain technology. Uh, but there are a lot of other superpower countries that, that isn't a problem. And for Singapore, that's one thing that's very special, the reputation of Singapore being really politically quite neutral. Um, and that, I think, is not a bad thing. All right. Um, maybe I'll take just the last two questions um, in the interest of time. Uh, and so the first one actually kind of uh, piggybacks off some, uh, some of the points you mentioned just in this previous answer. Uh, maybe I'll rephrase it slightly uh, about, a, about there being a government-owned space agency uh, for Singapore. Is it justifiable? Is it even necessary? I know there was a large portion about it in the Insights report itself. Um, but according to you, what do you think uh, justifies having a, a space agency? But when you want to look at, um, say, KPIs that you know that they will justify, uh, you know, the spending of, of taxpayers' money, you basically look at several things, right? One, especially as being Singapore, the economic return, all right? NASA just released uh, what happened last year in 2019, all right? For every U.S. dollar that went into NASA's federal budget in 2019, it generated three dollars worth of revenue. Again, one of the best return on investments in the market. All right. NASA really creates so many jobs and is expecting to create even more jobs um, that, that it's, it's really justifies just having one um, agency that does that. So just economics wise, it seems to make sense. Uh, it, you know, the, it does streamline certain approaches in uh, space exploration. It does create a lot of jobs. It does grow home based, homegrown talent. And that's immeasurable. Uh, trying to grow people who are interested in this sort of thing, uh, who can do this sort of thing with a, with a talent base. I think that's something very important. Now, what else would you look at in terms of KPI? Is it good for public services? Um, and, and there, I think, is, is a social impact that, I mean, I think an economist can do a probably good study on. Um, in cases like pandemics, tsunamis, things like that, what is the impact of having one global space organization that can take care of that? All right. So the, the test case being, for example, if you had Hurricane Katrina, for example, um, and if you had the U.S. agencies, federal uh, federal agencies dealing with it with space-based technology, uh, versus the tsunami, for example, Boxing Day that we had in Southeast Asia, 
Um, if we didn't have the space technology, what is the what are what are we losing? Basically, I think that's something that we need to look at. Now, going forward, um, would there be enough work to do? Does it justify taxpayers' money? Uh, one of the things that we do with taxpayers' money is to create jobs, um, to future-proof the economy. And yes, then obviously you, this would help. So I think you can see where I'm coming out. I, I do think it does make sense to have uh, an agency, not just to coordinate, which I think is important. A coordinated response is always nice. But having an agency and a coordinated view does several things. One is it gives stability um, to companies. Companies like that. Businesses like stability. They like to know what to do. They like to streamline processes or they go into a one-stop shop and they get what they need for their space stuff. And that will help it, number one. Number two, it raises Singapore's visibility on the international arena, all right? So NASA, for example, everybody knows NASA, right? I mean, you see the worm uh, logo, you see the NASA thing, everybody knows NASA, everybody thinks the moon landing, everybody thinks the United States. Everybody keeps thinking, oh my God, we have to do business with the United States, so let's create ITAD free zones, let's do blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Why? Because of the branding of NASA. And having a brand on an international arena is something that is also invaluable. It's something that we need to consider. So that's the other thing, the, the raising Singapore's visibility even just on the international uh, scene. The third thing is, of course, when you have a government agency um, and you have uh, certain policies, you can also then plan in the future. So having a fragmented approach, you have much more coordinated wise, uh, a nationwide plan. That's how Moon to Mars Artemis works is being coordinated by one central agency. It does have a whole bunch of bilateral agreements with different agencies, but it's coordinated by one. That's how the big projects are done. So um, yeah, you see seeing where I come up with that, I think. All right, and uh, perhaps the last question, bringing it back to uh, your area of expertise. What are the main gaps in international law in regards to space, uh, which remain to be developed or clarified? And which are the particular ones that Singapore should Wow, well, that's a, Sean, thank you for the question. That's a tough question. Uh, main gaps in international law. Um, the first thing that of course comes to mind is the space resource extraction issue. Um, now one, we, I think, I personally think that it's better to engage than to disengage, especially on the international level. That means we want people to stay in line with uh, policies of the international community and with international law rather than break those norms. And the reason for that is to get people engaged. It's a bit like ASEAN, right? You get the people engaged and you get them speaking to each other. It's much better than isolating and trying to keep them to their own little, uh, little corner. So um, I think the space resource extraction thing is really important because as the technology comes closer and closer, there are countries that are now saying, okay, we're going to allow it. And this is how we're going to allow it. And I think we need clarity on the uh, international level of what to do with that. Um, now, Singapore has taken quite a strong role historically with the law of the sea, in particular with the United Nations uh, um, conferences on the law of the sea, and there it might be something that Singapore wants to look into as well. Uh, and a third, uh, second area which might be interesting given recent developments as well, and might answer then a bit of Brian's question from below, uh, is on the question of dispute settlement. Basically, uh, you are probably all very well aware, recently we had the Singapore Mediation Convention, um, broke it, signed uh, in Singapore, um, and, um, and it's got a, a tremendous uptake for an international convention, like tremendous. Uh, it's a fantastic job. It's, it's also the acknowledgement of different ways of settling disputes. Now, I think it was, uh, there's this lovely book, which I have here somewhere, that we are. So it's Michael Neufeld, uh, the MIT Press, and it's a lovely book on the concise history of space flight. And he says there, somewhere in the book, a very interesting thing, there are only two threats to stable space infrastructure, space debris and space war. Now, you will avoid space war if you have very good dispute settlement mechanisms. And that's basically the principle that all of us are living by. We don't think about it anymore, but this year the United Nations is 75 years old. It means 75 years without a world war. And how is that based on? The maintenance of international peace and security through peaceful settlement of disputes. Once upon a time was fine, whoever had the biggest guns won. Today we sit at a table and we talk about it like civilized people. And I think there's where Singapore can champion it, just following on the Singapore Mediation Convention. The last thing is space debris, as I mentioned already. Um, it's, I think it's something that Singapore would be good taking a step at as well. We have an international reputation for being a clean and green city. Uh, you know, we, we are very forward-looking, we're very tech-based, 
Um, and space debris is going to be something that's going to get worse and worse with the Kessler syndrome, with more and more mega constellations going up. Uh, we still don't have the technology to either mitigate or remedy all that junk in orbit. At some point, it's going to be this wall -E situation, right? Where we're going to have like all this kind of junk around the planet, we can't even get out, you know? So when you kind of go into outer space, you punch through a whole wall of, of space junk. And we don't want that. Uh, we certainly don't want to also put a lot of money into building space assets to send up and get them crashed somewhere, um, you know, with, with something. If you want a pretty good uh, view of what would happen, you just watch Gravity and you see, just don't do what George Clooney did, but uh, George Clooney's character did. But, but no, when you see that, that's exactly what happens in outer space. And there, Singapore can take a, a leadership role as well. The environmental protection of the outer space and the orbit around Earth, basically. Okay, great. Um... I think that should be it for uh, today. We'll, uh, it was a very, very uh, informative and entertaining session. Thank you, Prof. Go. Um, I have sent a message in the. Oops, sorry. I've sent a message in the chat for all our uh, attendants today. It's uh, a link to where you can go to download the insights report that we referenced several times during this uh, talk. And uh, yeah, uh, that should be all. Uh, we do. Yeah, we do. Uh, we hope to see you again for future sessions of uh, uh, with SEDS SG. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for. Thanks very much.